As artificial intelligence continues to evolve, the demand for electricity is skyrocketing. Data centres already consume roughly 2% of global electricity, which is more than 10 times New Zealand's annual generation. And this figure is projected to double by next year. Around the world, AI's energy demands are rising faster than clean energy capacity can keep up. In Northern Virginia, the major a major data centre hub, AI-driven power use is expected to triple by 2029, while clean energy capacity will only double. We are well positioned to attract data centre investments. Uh, this is according to one researcher. However, he points out the country faces limitations with our current energy generation capacity. While hydroelectric and geothermal energy is a reliable source, these methods alone may not be suffice to meet the growing demand. Maybe it's time to embrace nuclear energy as a viable solution to bridge the gap, despite our long-standing political aversion to nuclear power. Thomas Scrimger is a researcher at Maxim Institute, and it's my pleasure to say good afternoon. Welcome in. Thank you for having me. Thomas, the N-word, nuclear. Um, let's just first start with how much power AI needs and its growth. Can you give us some kind of um, some detail about the data centers that you know will be needed? Yeah, absolutely. So um, as you were saying, data centers already consume a tremendous amount of power globally. Um, so they were 2% of uh, global power growth back in 2022, and it's only uh, going up and up. Um, these data centers, you know, for training these AI models that, that everyone is using, you know, ChatGPT is the most famous, but there are, there are dozens of them. They use yeah. immense amounts of power. Um, and the thing is, is that it's, it's quite quick to build a data center. It can take 12 to 18 months to build one but it'll take three to seven years to build the power station for it. Uh, the best wow. example of this is Elon Musk's XAI. Um, Elon Musk's AI company uh, decided to build the largest data center in the world, 100,000 graphics processing units. And they did it in 122 what? days. And then oh they decided gosh. it wasn't big enough, so they doubled its size, and it only took them 92 more. And this thing requires the power of a small city to run, um, and so they're having to find ways to find power for it. And for them currently, that's natural gas. Wow. Um, so you believe that we can attract investment here if we can produce and we can provide um, these warehouse size centers. Are you talking, are we talking billions of dollars of global investors? Oh, absolutely. Um, so... When we're talking about why New Zealand is a good place um, to build these data centers, we have a few things that are really going for us. Uh, the first is a cool climate. Um, mm. A lot of the energy required to power a data center is to stop them overheating. You know, you might be familiar with your laptop or your phone getting warm when you use it too yeah. much. Now place yeah. 100,000 of them in a building and, and you've got to try and keep <laughs> the thing cool. And also yeah. politically stable. These are quite sensitive bits of infrastructure. If you've got all your important data um, being processed and stored, you don't want it to be in a, in a hostile country. So New Zealand's actually quite a good place. And we're talking billions of dollars. In fact, it's, it's already billions of dollars. Um, there's a lot of you know, smaller local providers of data centers, but then we have two of the big players already here. So Microsoft is building a, a data center in West Auckland with a um, billion dollars. And Amazon Web Services, you know, so Amazon is, is the customer facing brand. Um, they're looking to spend more like $8 billion over the next 15 years. So they're already here um, wow. because we have these great features going for us. But the real limiting factor is that, that power price. Yeah. And I mean, because, you, you, you know, our renewable energy mix, I mean, how, you know, geothermal, um, hydro, sun, whatever we've got, how does it stack up? Uh, against the energy demands of these big tech data centers? Poorly, I could imagine. <laughs> well, we're certainly not uh, producing as much power as we could be, and we have to ask the question, where are we going to get it from? Yeah. Hydroelectric electricity is fantastic. Like, it's good at the kind of all occasions for power production, uh, but mm -hmm. the challenge is, is that we've, we've dammed some of the major rivers, and I'm not sure we would dam another one. There hasn't really been a compelling case made. So if we could find another place to put a hydroelectric dam, we should be really, um, really enthusiastic about that. And geothermal is, is really good. Um, and if we, the kind of the best forecast models suggest 
maybe we could do double the amount we're doing now. And geothermal is not 100% renewable. Like these, um, the geothermal activity can be changed by, by drawing on it, but it's sort of quasi renewable. It's, it's reliable and, and long term. Yeah. Then we have solar and wind and some other things filling it out. So we have a lot going for us, but we have to be thinking about where can we expand. And because data centers require a constant power demand, they run at all times of day at relatively the same levels of electricity. Um, so what we need to do is think about well, what's it's it's base load power demand. It's reliable. So things like wind and solar are, are good additions to our electricity mix. We don't need to demean them but they do not provide that base load power production because they're highly variable, different times of sure. day, different times of yeah. year. Um, really well, the wind doesn't of, blow and the sun doesn't more? shine, Thomas, you know? Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and the, the low sunlight hours and low wind coincide in midwinter um, when we're using more for, for heating. So it's, it's not simply that they're variable, um, but, but it is the same time of year. And batteries are really good for, for helping them. Um, and so uh, particularly for peak demand over a 24 hour period. So for managing the fact that, uh, you know, during five and 9 p.m., the sun might not be shining, but it's been, been sunny all day. The battery can smooth that peak demand. That's really good. But mm. we think about the weeks in the middle of winter, batteries really aren't quite there yet for that kind of, um, that kind of usage. You know, I've got to bring up the fact, and um, Thomas, I know you'll be asked this all the time when you talk about nuclear energy, is we are a shaky country. We are, well, you know, prone to earthquakes. Are we, people are, people are concerned that we could be another uh, Fukushima? What do you say to that? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question to bring up. And people do have a lot of concern about the earthquake question and Fukushima specifically. And so it's worth talking about um, Fukushima to start with. Um, yep. So that was a, a major earthquake and, and tsunami in Japan about 15 years ago. And, and the earthquake and the tsunami killed about 20,000 people in Japan. So it was a major, major event. And then the nuclear power plant at Fukushima melted down. And there was this really significant concern that the radiation from this nuclear power plant would do a tremendous amount of damage, that large numbers of lives would be lost. But actually what we've seen since then is, is in the 15 or so years since that event happened, that uh, there is one potential death that is contested from radiation, a case of cancer, and no one else. So in an earthquake that killed 20,000 people, the nuclear power plant did not um, kill people through radiation, even though it melted down. But when we're talking about nuclear for New Zealand, we're actually talking about something uh, a bit different. I think if New Zealand were to go the nuclear route, um, a yep. conventional nuclear reactor is probably not where we'd head, um, simply because they're just uh, too big for our, our requirements. The upfront cost is too large. Yep. But nuclear power is changing pretty quickly with what's called small modular reactors, SMRs. And so okay. instead of a big um, reactor, like you might imagine from The Simpsons, we're scaling it way <laughs> down and they operate slightly differently. Uh, and, and, and the earthquake risk from the is, is lower for those. Yeah, right. That's what everyone has in mind, right? Homer Simpson yes. and the kind of the incompetent management and the glowing green rods and all of that. Yeah. And so people kind of have that stereotype of nuclear power, um, but it's not really where it's heading now. Okay, so let's have a quick look at these. Um, yeah, so you're, they're called small modular reactors, one tenth the size of conventional plants. Uh, they're, um, they're, you say they're already been used, they could be installed in a fraction of the time. Um, mm hmm. Americans, the Americans want them by the end of the decade. One company, New Scale, already has regulatory, regulatory approval. Canada will build four 300 megawatt reactors by the mid uh, 2030s. And Japan is reversing plans to decommission its nuclear power plants, I gather, for these SMRs. So th they sound like the world, these are the ones that the world wants. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's worth thinking about um, where nuclear power generally is heading in the world. Uh, there was sort of this um, decline of interest in, in nuclear power for, for a few decades there. But uh, uh, two years ago, I think 2023 at the um, uh, COP summit, over 30 nations have signed up to a pledge to triple nuclear power production globally by 2050. So, so nuclear is where it's all headed. Um, wow. And so these SMRs are the new way to do this. And so they're an emerging technology. There's actually quite a large number of countries exploring them around 80 different designs are competing for what's um, the way to do this. But one of the reasons these are so good is that it should um, bring down construction costs because they're small and modular. You can mm. manufacture them in, in single places and then ship them to where they're going to be installed. 
because part of the problem with nuclear power plants hasn't been the health and safety risks. It's been the construction costs for these plants. So if we can right. scale down the size um, and then standardize manufacturing procedures, the actual costs of putting in um, nuclear power will come down significantly. And so certainly that's where the world's heading with, with nuclear power. Thomas, have you looked into how many of these plants we would need for a country our size? Well, so it really depends on what else we do with electricity. And at one level, it depends on the price point we're sold at, because you can always find things to do with more electricity if you yes. can um, afford it. Um, and, and so it, it really depends on what else we do. So the government has also, when we're talking about sort of new ways of generating power, talked about supercritical geothermal. And so uh, it, it's similar to conventional geothermal, where you're getting heat from the Earth's core. And so that's uh, supercritical is going down significantly deeper, five kilometers into the Earth's surface to get, get loads more power. So if Jeez. that really um, comes, comes to fruition, and, and that'll be sort of a, a decade away, but if we get a lot of power there, then maybe nuclear is, is going to be less significant for us. If someone really made a push to, to dam another river, um, you know, we wouldn't uh, need as many nuclear reactors, right? So there's all these mm. inter uh, uh, interacting forces for what we could do. My argument essentially is that New Zealand shouldn't choose in the abstract, we don't need nuclear. We should take it seriously as an option and set up the regulatory framework so we're allowed to build them. And then the market can figure out how many, if any, do we need. Very good point. Um, why, why do you think, Thomas, that um, nuclear power became so controversial in New Zealand? Do you think we've, we've let historical protests, like if we go back to the 80s, uh, kind of hold us back from exploring it? I can smell the uranium on your breath. <laughs> 